I'm having some bandwidth issues here, but we're going to continue on. With the I end think you're on mute, Jackson. Can you not hear me? Oh, there you I, go. I can hear you now. Yeah, we can hear you now. Okay. We shall continue on with the end of first letter of MMT. And then we'll finish up the second one pretty quickly. And passage that relates to the epistle of Hebrews here. You know that I believe that Hebrews was written by a Qumran Essene or someone like that to other Essenes of this type. We will look later on, if there's time, at a text called The Coming of Melchizedek. These Essenes thought Melchizedek was coming back as Messiah. And in that text, there are quite a few signs that relate specifically to the epistle of the Hebrews scheme of Melchizedek priesthood. And the only way I can understand Hebrews properly is in the context of the coming of Melchizedek. 11Q13. But anyway, we're going to start with um, the members of the priesthood must be careful about these matters so they'll not bring sin to the people, for it's written, he shall slaughter it on the side of the altar. He shall slaughter it on the side of the altar. They are slaughtering bulls and lambs and she-goats outside the camp. On the contrary, the lawful place of slaughter is at the north within the camp. That would be within Jerusalem, but outside the temple. We reckon that the temple is the tent of witness while Jerusalem is the camp. Outside the camp means outside Jerusalem. It refers to the camp of their cities outside the camp, which is Jerusalem. Is that Hebrews chapter 10 that talks about Yahshua being murdered outside the camp? with the awful and that type of thing. Well, that directs, that, that's directly related to this text, if that's the case. Regarding the sin offering, they are to remove the offal of the altar and burn it outside Jerusalem, for it's the place that he chose from among all the tribes of Israel to establish his name there as a dwelling. They are not slaughtering in the temple. So, you know, a quick overview of especially Hebrews 10 will, will directly relate to this text. Then regarding pregnant animals, we maintain that one must not slaughter both the mother and the fetus on any one day. I don't know what that means. Also concerning anyone eating the fetus, we maintain that he may eat the fetus that is in its mother's womb only after its separate slaughter. Yeah? Yeah? Yeah. So if they ate it with her, it means that she was one with it. Oh, oh, I see. Okay. Well, th this heifer would have to be delivered first. It would have to be delivered one way or the other. It had to remain alive. But by being able to deliver, if they received that, 
I think, yeah, I'm getting the point. I'm just thinking that because they, were, they thought legally, if we don't separate it, then she's not a I see. Yeah, that makes sense. Look at this minutia, though. We got, yet this minutia was important enough for them to possibly write the king or the high priest or somebody about. And this particular text was found numerous caves in fragmentary form. Most of it was in four, but was in 11 and cave one parts of it, etc. You know that this is the proper view since the matter stands written, a pregnant animal, dot, dot, dot. Then, uh, with respect to Ammonites and Moabites and the bastard, and the man with crushed testicles, and the man with damaged male organ, who are entering the assembly, taking wives to make them one bone, dot, 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 polluted. We also reckon that one must not, dot, 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 and one must not have intercourse with them, and one must not integrate them and make them one bone. And one must not bring them in. For you know that some of the people are integrating. For the sons of Israel must guard against all illicit marriage and thus properly revere the temple. Now it goes into a, a topic similar to this that's important to us, and that is the blind. Concerning them who cannot see as to avoid polluting mingling and to whom sinful mingling is invisible, as well as the deaf who hear neither law nor statute nor purity regulation, and do not hear the statutes of Israel. For, and this is a quote, he who cannot see and cannot hear does not ha know how to perform the Torah. These people are trespassing on the purity of the temple. I'm thinking, oh, there's no temple, there's no camp, unless we should make one. But technology has changed. This seems to me to be one of those laws that the community rule and the Damascus document might address when it talks about the rule has to change for new people and for new times, because this certainly isn't true now, that you can't do Torah because you're impotent or one other thing yeah no 40 a.d we don't know who's talking who they're talking to all we have are the fragments of two letters that fit precisely in the political milieu and history of somewhere between 35 and 42. Yeah, you know, the reason that we say 42 is the consensus right now is that the second, the second letter coming up is written to Agrippa. And you know, Agrippa died in 42. But there was never a time that we know of, and maybe when Allison does her presentation, we will find a time where this fits. So what we've got to do is take the internal evidence, despite what paleographers guess 
at the time. You know, the paleographers that have worked on this are all consensus. They want it to be way early. And uh, an another text, two texts, the Habakkuk Pesher and the Psalms Pesher can't fit anywhere else but about this same time, historically. The big tip-off here, of course, is the, um, the laws against Gentiles, because that was taken away right at this time, a little before. It was taken away, I'm thinking, soon after Caligula sent his statue down to put in the temple. Same time, you might remember that the Roman eagles were in the temple and someone climbed up and cut them down. Same time that Agrippa builds his porch. Same time where we find in Acts 21, those who were zealous for the Torah he says, the many thousands that are zealous for the Torah, the exact term used in Josephus and other places for what he also calls the innovation or fourth philosophy. There was a never a time like this. We have these groups popping up like Jewish Christians, Abionites, Nazarenes, Oseans, Masbuthians, Samsonians, these groups that were, except for little intricate uh, variances in their opinions of the law, were all there. Before that, we had Hasidians in the first century BC and second century BC that most certainly were the predecessors of these messianics of the first century. Well, that's what really sets them apart. The fact that all of a sudden these messianic groups were popping up. And as Yahshua says in the Olivet Discourse, messiahs will arise. We know of six or seven of those messiahs that did arise, who were all destroyed along with all their people. We know some with intricate detail who they were. Even the New Testament speaks of them in Acts chapter 